A number of years ago, I got an invitation to um, go to a symposium at Andrews University with Umberto Rossi, if any of you know about Umberto Rossi and his Christ in the Classroom symposiums, and it, on faith and learning. Well, my background is in um, curriculum and educational policy studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you know anything about Madison, you, I don't need to explain to you what kind of an in institution that is, the most liberal of the liberal institutions. Um, anyway, when Umberto sent me this invitation on the integration of faith and learning, instantly it came to my mind, oh great, here we go again. We're going to learn how to count disciples instead of apples. Let's integrate faith. And it just made no sense to me. But I thought, you know, this is a pretty pres prestigious symposium. I'll go. See what happens. And what you do in those two weeks is write an article, which he then puts in as a chapter of a book. And the topic that I chose was postmodernism in education, which was something that I knew a little bit about. If anybody can say they know anything about postmodernism, which is something nobody knows anything about. So um, anyway, it was a wonderful experience. But one of the best things was I was introduced to a genre of literature that I had never heard of before. George Marsden. Um, James Sire, some of these big names in the integration of faith and learning. I'd never heard of these people. And the first book I decided to read was George Marsden. And I oh, my goodness, this guy is really dense. And here was this teeny little book, and I struggled through it. Well, once I got through it, then I was really glad that I did and began reading all the other books. And I thought, yes, this is exactly what I've been looking for. I am tired of the, oh, I just love Jesus so much. He is in my heart. I don't need to be smart. I'm so tired of that. And I had my students say stuff like that to me when I was teaching my class the integration of faith and learning, and I was trying to get them to think deeply and to study and to learn and to know why they believed. I want a faith that won't just give me cotton candy and sent me through the county fair. I want a faith that's strong enough to see me through Auschwitz. Not that I'm not going to suffer, not that I'm, not, I'm going to come out on the other end, but that I will be faithful in Auschwitz. And you can't do that on cotton candy. So anyway, let me introduce you to some literature. Ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> this is one of the books I used a lot in my class in the Integration of Faith and Learning. James Sire, Discipleship of the Mind. Really a good introduction to the integration of faith and learning. Another person that I like, and you can watch all these people on YouTube. I love watching Os Guinness. He's very smart and he's very clear. This one is A Time for Truth, and I have a number of his books. I think that's the first one I did. One of my favorites is Nancy Piercy. And if you have been coming to this class for a long time, you probably remember looking at Nancy Piercy's book, Total Truth. Really, really good. Of all the books that I'm going to share with you today, Nancy Piercy's Total Truth probably is at the top of my list. This is a second book that she wrote. But since Paul asked me to do this class, as you heard last week, Gary offered my services. <laughs> um, I thought, I don't know enough about this guy. So I ordered a couple of books, and I thought when they come, I'll read them. Well, the first one, uh, Scientism and Secularism, an outstanding book, really gives you a good link with science and why scientism is such a problem. Well, when I ordered the book, I ordered them. They were supposed to come on Wednesday. Well, I needed it. To, I needed to start sooner than that. So I downloaded the Kindle book and read the whole thing. It takes about five hours for me to get through it. Really good book on scientism. And our speaker is going to explain that more. But I didn't get so far in this one. I slowed down. I wanted to think about it. I wanted to mark some things in my Bible. This one is love your God with all your mind. We're really into a heart and an airy fairy time in Christianity in the United States today, even in our own church. And I get so tired of it. 
I want to hear something where people have been thinking deeply about Christianity. When we first moved to Loma Linda a number of years ago, I was disappointed because I thought, oh good, I'm going to go out there where all these people are going to be thinking these deep, wonderful thoughts about Christianity. And after coming through my PhD program, I needed to hear from some people who hung on to stuff and really wrestled with it. Well, the uh, first Sabbath school class I went to was a little bit of a disappointment. So somebody suggested to Gary that I needed to go to the intellectual Sabbath school. So I did. And there I learned the age of the Earth is billions of years old, and we, we got here through a, a process of evolution. No, Jesus isn't coming again. And that was Sabbath school. I thought, okay, I don't need that. I need help here. And so I quit going to that one as well. This is a book that answers a lot of the questions that any thinking Christian would be interested. Now, all of these people are not Seventh-day Adventists. So you're going to run across a few things like, as soon as you die, you go straight to heaven. If you can get beyond that and you think about how they do their apologetics, you're going to be really, really pleased that you have chosen to read this book. But it is now 1030. The, the video is about 24 in, minutes long. It's introduced by some scientists from Biola University. So let's just get started. JP, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, which is associated with Biola University. I don't know if you've heard of that. He received a bachelor's in physical chemistry from the University of Missouri, so I would say that. THM in theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, an MA in philosophy from the University of California in Riverside. Oh yeah, and then a PhD in philosophy at the University of Southern California. He's authored, edited, or contributed to papers in 95 books, including Does God Exist? Consciousness and the Existence of God, The Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, and Debating Christian Theism. He has also published over 85 articles in journals such as Philosophy and Phenomenological Research, American Philosophical Quarterly, Religious Studies, and Faith and Philosophy. Moreover, JP was selected in August 2016 by the website The Best Schools as one of the 50 most influential living philosophers. So a great privilege to have JP Moreland speak to us this evening. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to thank you again on behalf of my colleagues for coming and being with us this evening. My job was to edit and to contribute two chapters to the philosophical section of this hernia-inducing book, <laughs> and uh, I was privileged to, to do that. Um, this coming August will mark three years that I began a battle with three different forms of cancer uh, and that I continue to this day to be fighting. Um, I don't know how long I have. I could have 15 years. I, I get tested every six months. Uh, and uh, my tests are clear at this point, but uh, I'm looking forward to dying. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, I'm really very serious about that, not the process but uh, the, the event itself. Um, but what is interesting is this, these cancers, the one on my colon had thir involved 31 lymph nodes and it was a massive tumor, had actually been developing for years, uh, just under, beneath the surface and I didn't know it. And during that time, I was concerned with things that were kind of more pressing, like my, I turned 70 in two days and my ankles, were getting stiff. I'd get up in the morning and I'd have to loosen them up. And uh, some other minor health issues uh, regarding skin cancers and things like that. But, but little did I know that my attention to these kind of more surface issues, uh, while I was doing that, underneath the surface there was this growing malignancy that, was, that could very easily destroy me. Now I think the same thing is happening with theistic evolution and the church. 
uh, in the church, we're involved with trying to have small groups and to get our worship down and and to have uh, preaching that sort of relates to unbelievers. Not against all that, but all of that is sort of, in my opinion, surface issues. While we are allowing the worldviews in our culture to slowly permeate like leaven our churches, and it is increasingly causing people to lose confidence in the Bible. One of the reasons young people are uh, in the church are sexually active is they simply don't believe Jesus knew what he was talking about. They don't believe that, the, that virginity is actually the path to a flourishing life. And so they take the Bible not to be authoritative. It's, it's something from an old, crudgety, curmudgeon God, and it's not for today. Now, um, as a result of that, in addition to the doctrinal issues that Wayne so, uh, is so good at laying out, there's another issue going on with theistic evolution, and that is the, the question of, of who gets the right to define what's real. Who has that right? Well, the answer to that is the person who has knowledge. A person who has knowledge of dentistry has the right to tell us how molars work. A person who has knowledge about a certain range of, of, of study has a right to tell us about literature. So it is on the basis of knowledge that people have authority to speak and act in public because they know something that makes them uh, an expert or allows them to, to conduct those activities. But what theistic evolution has done, as I'm going to show you now, has actually contributed to something called scientism, which has... The price that we've paid for that is that we've allowed people to come into the faith because they, we don't want to cause them to bulk a theistic evolution or an evolution. But the price is that as a result, people no longer regard the Bible as a source of knowledge. They instead embrace what's called scientism. Now, there are two forms of scientism. Uh, there's strong and weak scientism. Strong scientism is the idea that the hard sciences are the only source of knowledge and truth about reality. Anything outside the hard sciences, uh, uh, the humanities, uh, good Lord, theology and ethics, is simply nothing but personal, uh, private feeling and emotion. And uh, uh, we must tolerate these personal opinions because nobody knows who's right. And there probably isn't anybody right when it comes to ethical and theological issues. As an illustration of this, years ago I was giving an evangelistic talk at a little dessert in a person's home. And one of the Christian brothers said he was inviting his boss, who had a Ph.D. in physics from Hopkins and had been an engineer for about 20-some years, and that he hated Christianity. And he actually went out of his way at work to badger Christians at the coffee uh, uh, um, pot and uh, and go after them for their Christianity. And I said, well, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm there, uh, and I'm at the hors d'oeuvre table, and I can see my friend come in, and he's got an older gentleman with him, and it's obviously his boss. They make a beeline to me, and my, my friend introduces me to this gentleman, and after we exchange pleasantries, he says, say, I understand you're a philosopher and a theologian. And I said, well, I give it my best effort. Uh, and he said, yeah. He said, you know what? I used to be interested in that stuff, too, when I was a teenager. But when I grew up and matured intellectually, I began to realize that if you can't quantify it and measure it and test it empirically in the lab, it's nothing but hot air and empty opinion. I had a woman come up to me before this gathering saying, that a dear friend of hers is undermining and leaving the faith because uh, he believes that science has undermined belief in God. Now, that's what this gentleman was expressing with scientism, strong scientism. Only the hard sciences can tell us what's true and real and that we can know. It's the scientist who speaks with authority today. Now... Uh, the problem with strong scientism is that it's obviously self-refuting uh, because the statement, 
The only thing that you can know and can, that can be true of reality is what can be tested by the hard sciences, cannot itself be tested by the hard sciences, therefore it fails to live up to its own criterion of acceptability. It's like saying there are no sentences of English longer than three words. Uh, that sentence is self-refuting. And so I, I let the gentleman talk for about two minutes. And he made, I, I'm going to guess, 20, 30 assertions. And I stopped him and I said, look, I, I'm confused and i got a problem and you you got to help me. I think what you're saying is that if, you, if you, the only thing that you can really know is what can, and can be true is what's tested in hard sciences. Everything else is hot air and personal opinion. That's what, that's what he said. He said, exactly. And I said, well, you've uttered about 20 or 30 assertions, and I can't think of a single one of them that could be tested by the empirical sciences. Now, if I'm wrong, would you tell me which assertion you've made that can be tested by the empirical sciences? But if you can't, my dilemma is that what you've been doing for the last two minutes is spewing hot air and idle opinion. It was self-refuting. Now, there's another form of scientism that we have mentioned in the book called weak scientism. This allows that there might be some low-grade justified beliefs outside of science. But it still holds that science is by far the most authoritative specter of knowledge, so that if philosophy and science come into conflict about whether there's a soul or whether you're just your brain, science is going to win that debate because it's got more authority than philosophy, even though philosophy may have a little bit of low-grade authority. Now, there are a lot of difficulties with weak scientism, I'm, and I'm going to list two of them very quickly. And for one thing, Weak scientism does not allow for the stating and justification of its own assumptions, of science's assumptions. Science makes assumptions. It assumes that there's such a thing as truth and that it's a correspondence with reality. It assumes a fairly a clear definition of knowledge as a true belief that's based on good evidence and good grounds. But none of these assumptions can be tested by science. Now, science cannot be any stronger than the assumptions on which it's based. Since weak scientism undermines the defense of the assumptions of science, it's actually a foe of science and not a friend, because those assumptions have got to be defended philosophically, not scientifically. So uh, weak scientism undermines science by failing to provide philosophical justification for the assumptions of science themselves. Uh, the second problem is that they, we know things out of sight of science. And that's just a plain fact. As a matter of fact, we know some things outside of science with far greater rational support than we know in science. For example, there are certain propositions in ethics that we know with more certainty than we know that there are electrons. And I'll give you an illustration of this. After my colon cancer surgery, my stomach wouldn't come back online, so I was in the hospital nine days. And I saw all kinds of nurses come in on different shifts. And one day this chipper nurse comes in, and she says, well, my, how are you today? And I said, I'm hanging in there. And she says, well, um, um, what, what do you do for a living? And, and I said, well, I, I, I was actually to, uh, majored in physical chemistry uh, in my undergraduate work, but then I went in and did an M, uh, a THM in theology and an MA and a PhD in philosophy, ultimate USC, and I'm a philosophy professor. And I could, there was a puzzled look on her face. This actually happened. I said, I know, if you don't mind, I'd like to predict what that, what you're thinking right now, and you tell me if I'm wrong. What I believe you're thinking is, gosh, you started off in a field of study where there are hard facts, and you can really know whether you're right and wrong, and you went over to this stuff where nobody knows who's right, and there's just a bunch of opinions, and it's largely just about kind of saying whatever you want. She said, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. And I said, well, i got to tell you, you're dead wrong about that. In fact, it may be the opposite. I know an ethical claim with more certainty than I know that there are electrons. And she looked at me like I'd parsed every Hebrew verb in the Old Testament. I mean, she was just... And, and, and I, she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, take the claim, torturing little babies for the fun of it is wrong. I, am, I have more rational support for that than I do that there's a belief in electrons, and here's why. I said, do you know anything about the history of the electron? 
No. Well, I do. I've studied it from J.J. Thompson all the way up uh, the debate between German wave theorists about the electron and the British particle theorists, all the way to the Bohr electron, up to the quantum electron. And if you ask me, do I believe in electrons, I'm going to have to ask you, which one did you have in mind? Now, you probably mean the present one. But look... Is it beyond reasonable doubt that 50 years from now we will no longer believe that the electron as we currently conceive of it exists, given the history of the electron, and we might believe something completely different exists? Is that conceivable to you? Well, sure. Now, I said it's not conceivable to me that in 50 years we will find new evidence that will make the assertion torturing little babies for the fun of it is wrong rationally incorrect. Now, don't get me wrong. I can imagine a situation where everybody in society would believe in torturing little babies for fun, but I can't think of rational evidence that would come in that would make that assertion obviously an irrational one. Thus, I have greater certainty in an ethical claim than I do in a scientific claim. My point? I don't know, but it was an interesting story. <laughs> now, now, my point is that there are areas of knowledge in theology and in ethics that we know with greater certainty than some of the assertions in science, and it goes both ways. There are sources of knowledge outside of science, and we need to learn to live with that fact. Now, um, the problem then with theistic evolution is that it reinforces a commitment to scientism, and you end up with a revisionist view of the Bible. Now, some people say, look, theistic evolution is what allowed me to embrace Christ because I had a problem with creation, and I would have never become a Christian if I hadn't uh, been, had the option of theistic evolution. Now, my response is the following. Number one, if you're talking to somebody about Jesus and they want to talk about evolution, my view is to say, look, let's not worry about that right now. Let's kind of stick with what you think of Jesus, and let's get to that later. But I'm not going to tell them it's okay for you to believe in that right now, because first of all, I think what Steve Meyer and others have done is shown that we don't have an obligation to do that, and we've actually got biblical grounds not to. But the other reason is... That if I allow, tell a person, hey, there's no problem with that, and they become a Christian on that basis, they've already started a revisionist project in the Bible. Because they've revised the first three chapters of Genesis. And then when it comes to when neuroscientists claim there's no soul, well, of course, we'll have to revise the Bible. No problem with that. The Bible's not a science textbook anyway. And by the way, there's no gender we've learned in science. Okay, no problem with that. And we've also learned that homosexuality is a deterministic factor by your genetic structure and your brain chemistry. So you're not morally responsible for that. Hey, okay. After a while, what authority does the Bible have any longer? So I think theistic evolution undermines the authority of growing in Christ, even though there might be a short-term benefit in a person getting in the door. The way he got in the door is not going to let him grow over the long run. Now, the second thing I want to deal with is a, is a very serious question, and that's when is it okay to disagree with what the majority of experts in a field believe. If I went to, to uh, and had 100 oncologists and 95 of them told me that you need to do this and five of them told me I needed to try natural remedies instead and they all had health food stores, um, I'm going to go with the 95, aren't you? If you had 95 realtors say this is a bad house to buy, and five, per, five per said it's okay, I'm going with the 95. I'm going to go with the majority of experts and unless something happens because when it comes to evolution, I do exactly the opposite because the overwhelming majority of the experts believe the theory of evolution is true. Now, am I rational in doing that or am I just doing it because I can't stand giving them a Bible? <laughs> I have Jesus in my heart. No, uh, that's not why I do it. I have, if there are two conditions present, 
then you are justified rationally in going against the majority of experts if these two things are present. Number one, if the majority opinion is based on non-rational factors. In other words, if the majority opinion is not based on the evidence, but it's based on non-rational factors. Is that true of evolution? Yes. There are two reasons that evolution is accepted by the majority of biologists and scientists today. And number one is because it got theology and God out of science. Um, the, probably one of the best text on the, on the Darwinian revolution, written by a historian at Georgia State, published by the University of Chicago Press, is Charles Darwin and the Problem of Creation, by Neil Gillespie. <clears throat> Gillespie makes the following statement about the Darwinian revolution. Darwin's rejection of special creation was part of the transformation of biology into a natural science. One committed to thoroughly naturalistic explanations based on material causes rather than appealing divine intervention. Later he says, now listen to this, this is absolutely crucial. He says, just as science shifted from a theological ground to a naturalistic one, religion shifted from being a field that provided knowledge to one based solely on blind faith. Now, the point is that scientists got tired of having to ask theologians what they had to believe. And so what, what Darwin did was allowed biology and paleontology to become purely naturalistic. So that while you're doing science, you have to adopt what's called methodological naturalism. You can only appeal to natural explanations, even though you may believe in God. So that was an evidence base. In fact, Gillespie says that for the first 50 years or so, all the evidence was on the side of the creationists. It was against Darwin. Darwin didn't win on the evidence for the first 50 years. He won on the fact that he allowed, he helped scientists naturalize their field and get theology out of their work. Secondly, the reason there's a majority opinion in science for evolution is the way young uh, undergrads are sociologized into the field. They are ostracized with institutional rewards and punishments if they don't accept evolution and if they mention intelligent design. I was giving a talk at UC Berkeley a handful of years ago, an evangelistic talk to, to about 800 students. And before I spoke, I heard that Bill Dembski had, been, had come to Berkeley two weeks earlier and gave a lecture on intelligent design. Now, Dembski's a stinking genius. He's got two doctorates, uh, one in math and one in philosophy, and um, he's no idiot. And the biology department boycotted the meeting and would not allow their grad or undergrad students to go hear him. Well, if he's a, such a doofus for believing in this stupid theory, sick your students on him and make a fool out of him in five minutes. The other thing uh, that this happened is I met a biology PhD student at UCLA, and he said he had developed an empirically testable intelligent design model for his doctoral dissertation, and he sent it to his supervisor, and his supervisor said, don't you even go close to this. I will not supervise this. Because if you touch this, you will never get your PhD, and I might lose my job. It won't work in this. So I believe that the, that the reason that there's a, a homogeneous acceptance of evolution is that it allowed biology to get religion out of science, especially God. So intelligent design isn't science, allegedly, it's religion. And it's because of the way the sociology of the practitioners now function. It's not based on evidence. That's reason number one. Criterion number two, for when it's reasonable to go against the authorities, even though they're in the majority, is not just there's an alternative explanation besides their rational evidence, but it is if there is a small rebel group of highly trained, educated, skilled practitioners who publish in peer-reviewed journals and in high-quality books and who have provided an alternative paradigm. 
Thomas Kuhn said that sometimes, uh, the philosopher of science, sometimes those rebel groups bring about a revolution and overturn the old theory. What we have in intelligent design today is not your granddaddy's creationists. These guys are S-M-A-R-T. And it's, by the way, it's about time Christians celebrated people that have credentials. I'm tired of pastors saying, you know, Jesus is for everybody. We don't care about being credentialed and all that stuff. Baloney. You need credentialed pe- Jesus is for everybody. I'm for a blue-collar family. But we need credentialed people in the church who can defend what we believe in the highest levels of acad- academia. Now, now, what we've got today is an unbelievably skilled rebel group of highly trained you get the book Theistic Evolution. If you're in here and you're not a, a you're a theistic evolutionist, look at the qualifications of the people who publish in that, and that'll be enough. Thank you very much. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu. Okay, now it's your turn. I assume he's had enough to say that it sparked a comment somewhere. Don't scratch your head, I'll think you want to speak. (laughs) This is an excellent uh, presentation. In fact, I... I'd say I agree with almost 100% of what he said. I uh, would ask, do you know what his stance is on creation and evolution and the recent creation? Uh, Obviously, we know his stance on secular evolution, but uh, about uh, a slow process of evolution and so on. I think, from what I've gathered Mm -hmm. by reading his books and watching his YouTube videos, I think he's moved from being a sort of long age to being pretty much what the Bible says is what it is. Oh, sorry. Did I get turned off? It's off? It's off. Is it better if I do this one or the other? That's off? Okay, let's see. This one says it's on. Okay. Um, I think from what I have seen him say that he he's a very conservative person in his views. Uh, obviously, when he started out talking about dying, it's obvious that he thinks the instant he dies, he's going to heaven. On the other hand, when he talks about science and creation, he seems to indicate that what the Bible says is what the Bible means, and that we can trust the Bible as a book of knowledge, not just a book of airy fairy faith. Hmm. Uh, oh, well, let's pass this back to the man. I'll, I'll raise another question. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, his reliance on uh, <clears throat> external things beyond science is is great. Uh, it's essential. But I also argue that science is one of the best tools, and I use the term uh, not pejoratively, but uh, it's one of the best simple tools we have for testing reality. And uh, I'll add to that, my science says there has to be a designer. That's where science, scientific community and I would, would, would part. And I think he would do, probably agree with me to, to, to that extent also. <laughs> so uh, his uh, moderate science or weak science as he called it this is the way to go because we don't want to exclude science it's a very good tool uh, but we don't want to limit our view to to just science because that's too simplistic 
he's very supportive of science <coughs> in his books and in his YouTubes. He he loves science. Science. He's also good friends with William Dembski and Steve Meyer, and uh, the whole intelligent design community. It, it appears. So he's not anti-science science in any way. He's anti the philosophical underpinnings that scientism bases its views on. And he says you can't have a structure built on a soft foundation. You, the foundation has to be good. Yeah, you've got to have some basis for... Uh, decision that I believe is rational. Now, I, I admire those people who say, well, I accept the Bible by faith, that's it. And I, uh, I know they're sincere and so on. I don't go that route myself. I'm, I'm more of a skeptic. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to say, hey, no, my, my science tells me uh, there's got to be a designer. There's got to be a designer. Uh, I, I find the Bible more rational representation of what a designer might present than, say, the, the writings of Hinduism or, uh, or Confucius and, uh, and so on, uh, uh, Buddhism and so on. Uh, uh, so I, 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 but I think basically, uh, even though we don't admit it, most people will say, well, I believe the Bible and so on. They use a fair amount of rationality before they... They know it's true, they know historically it's true, and so on. Uh, so that, I think, basically, our, our method of finding truth is rational. has to be. Yeah. A word of caution. Before I go too far, is this on at all? Can Sorry. you hear it all right? Yeah. Okay. I stand in awe of this man, 95 books and innumerable articles. As you know, you're currently studying Daniel and Revelation, and you're including my book in Daniel and Revelation, which must be Brilliant. at least a quarter of an inch wide in its larger parts. The problem is a man of this stature becomes an authority. When I was in college, they asked me to prepare a working library for a theologian, for a pastor. I did. The professor complained that I included no sermons by famous preachers. My answer was, they can't find the Sabbath, they can't find the state of the dead, they can't find the sanctuary. What is it that I'm looking for with these guys? They're all authorities. They can't find major things in the scripture. So I, I admire what he said today. But remember, a little bit of error sown with a lot of truth is the most dangerous error. I think where we have fallen down as educators is in giving up on this book as being true. We can rationalize so many things away, and the more we rationalize away what's in here, the weaker our view is of the Bible. One of the things that Moreland says that, that I agree with is Jesus was an intellectual. If you read Jesus and how much he loves you and the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and he's a, as a lamb and that's all you have, you miss the subtleties of his arguments when he argues with the Sadducees and the lawyers. And when you start looking for the intellectual arguments that Jesus made, you find out this was a really, really smart, well-educated man. Not well-educated by the Pharisees or in the schools of the Sadducees, but educated in this book. And, and we need to do that. I was always really distressed when my students would come to me after having a class in faith and learning and say, you know, I really don't need to know this stuff. I have a very simple faith. And the, what came to my mind was simpleton. I didn't say that. <laughs> but that's what I, I immediately thought. You don't even want to know something. You don't want to see what the Bible is saying and where it's true. We gave up on the Bible as knowledge and truth 150 years ago. 
in the in one of his talks he talks about the progress we made from 1800 in getting rid of the theologians and getting rid of the authority of the Bible and, and taking up on on all these other things and ceding to science the answer to everything the answer to the soul the answer to heaven the answer to life after death we shouldn't have ever given that up and I think particularly as Adventists we need to rethink how we teach about the truth and the knowledge that's in the Bible. One of the things Moreland says is that the Bible says a lot more about wisdom and knowledge than it does about faith. What an interesting idea. Wisdom and knowledge and knowing are, are the foundation of the Old Testament. Well, let's go back and see how that applies to us today. Okay, we've got it. Have you got two now? <laughs> Here you go. I, uh, I, I listened to the video before this class and then going through it again. Um, there's an element and it follows up immediately on what you just said. Using and I have I don't know a great deal about the presenter, but uh, and I respect his positions a great deal. But using his final statement about when you can disagree would have canceled out Christ, wouldn't it? Yeah. If you're waiting around for a group of authorities mm -hmm. to agree with you. Of course, he was the ultimate authority, but the Sadducees didn't believe that. But, but he does make the argument that Jesus doesn't leap into an argument with the Sadducees over what they brought to him. The, the Sadducees were trying to trick him, and so they came up with the story of the woman who had seven husbands. Well, whose husband, whose husband is she going to have in heaven? Is she going to be a polygamist, or what is she yes. going to be? Well, when you, um, when you see how cleverly Jesus responded, then you think, wow. We should have thought more about the answer than we did just about the big story. I think that's story. the point I was trying to make. Yeah. If you listen carefully, as a scientist myself, uh, I, I, it's wonderful if I can find a group of people with the credentials that reflect positively on the positions they've taken. But to establish that as my criterion, I'm uncomfortable with. And... Uh, I think that's easy. In fact, in this class, we, uh, I don't know the gentleman I'm going to refer to is here, the book we went through before this one, uh, the first author didn't have a doctorate. And yet it's one of the most well-researched books I have looked at, and I have it, uh, using using the literature, quoting it fairly, and point so... Having a PhD doesn't necessarily mean that you're an authority. Uh, I mean, it should be in some ways, but it doesn't necessarily. And have, not having one doesn't necessarily mean you're not an authority because you could have studied Precis a whole lot more. Precisely. And yeah. that focuses directly in on what I thought is it's very easy for someone who's as well recognized as he is yeah. to think, okay, this legitimizes, but uh, it does if they're on the right track, but yeah. it isn't a necessary condition. Well, this particular book of his, which I'm now reading, one of the things I like about this one is that he goes through various Bible texts and says, here's what God says about the mind. Here's he said, what God says about getting knowledge and that kind of thing. And I appreciate the fact that he's using the Bible. A lot of the Bible writers, only authority they had was that God spoke to them, they were prophets. You know, there weren't any uh, doctor, doctors. And, and I used to warn my students, just because a doctor wise person says it doesn't make it true. You are still responsible to go back and study for yourself, read for yourself, and not take everything this guy says is the gospel truth. I have read, seen a number of things in here that I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him on the state of the dead. I don't agree with him on the Sabbath. But when he uses the biblical texts 
to support getting knowledge and becoming wise Christians, then I, I like that. I like that somebody... I wish we did more of that. I wish that as Adventists we were more apologists than we are. And I, and I hope that we don't, uh, as Paul mentions often, we don't want to just go out and make somebody mad. We don't want to cut them off. We want to have good, rational, sound knowledge in order to make an argument. The Bible, as we all know, and the spirit of prophecy are giving us a lot of things amazing. Uh, but not always like whatsoever. I mean, good, good, uh, healthy food or or style life, whatsoever. It's good for us, but doesn't give you always doesn't give us always the answer why. So that uh, I'm so glad that in this institution that you are training uh, these younger people just to answer that question why that is not good or good so we need it's true we need faith of course and to grow in faith but also uh, we need qualified uh, people who can answer you know that most difficult question why why something or yeah. at least can work through an answer exactly with us. Yeah. So I'm so glad that in this institution you are doing just just like that, and uh, we are having more and more qualified people who can compete with with other people. Because the Paul said already in Timothy, you know, you have to defend yourself. You have to know why you, you believe. What do you believe? Yeah. And uh, praise praise the Lord for our good people. I think one of the things that we have done as Adventists is ignore one of the greatest gifts to the church that God gave us. I really think that we should have looked at Ellen White more as knowledge rather than devotional. I'm not big on devotional books. I don't go out and seek finding things that are going to calm my troubled spirit. You know, I, I want to go back to the word to, trouble, to calm my troubled spirit. I, uh, I will be very careful how I say this, but I'm a woman, so I can say it. <laughs> I really take exception to famous women who speak and just everything is about the heart. I have a head. Speak to my head, too. Don't just t speak to my touchy feeling and think that that's going to serve, serve me well. It doesn't serve me well. I, I object to taking Ellen White and dumbing the books down because we're too stupid to understand her anymore. Well, let's bring ourselves up and read what's there. And if we don't understand all the words, get out a dictionary. Look online. Find out what in the world she's talking about. Rather than just throwing it out and saying, well, she was just for devotional anyway. I mean, she was a woman. What can we expect? <laughs> So anyway, my, my position is, let's fix, feed our minds. The reason I started coming to this class was because I heard that the class was studying Nancy Piercy's book, Total Truth. And I thought, whoa, that's a, I got here just as they was, it was done. So I went home and got it and read it, and that was the primary textbook for my class in Faith and Learning for many years. It's wonderful if you haven't read it. Do yourself a favor and get Total Truth by Nancy Piercy. She's very challenging to the connection between science and faith. Have, have you all read Nancy Piercy? She's really, really an important scholar. Yes. Maybe just to add, and this was uh, when the war broke out over there in former Yugoslavia. Somehow uh, we enter in Sarajevo with. Uh, with some evangelistic campaign, and pastor was from Australia. So attendance was as never before, like 15, 10, or 20,000 people came to listen. So pastor started like a couple of days with the theological issues and, and a subject, and was great. But by the point, 
and uh, very bad was when he started to talk about the science and he's not qualified for that and there were so intellectual people and uh, of course uh, they came to the point just to have maybe two, three thousand people instead of twenty thousand people. So when a not qualified uh, a person talk about uh, something that he's not qualified, it's it, it's not good at all, you know. So um, may God help us to to be good students, as what? some Latin word says, "in cara in para." You know, I am always student, no matter how much I do have uh, knowledge. One of the strengths of this class is, and one of the reasons I keep coming is, because the class members are knowledgeable, and they're scientists, and they know what they're talking about. I am not a scientist, and so I try not to leap in to say things that I don't know anything about. But I learn coming here, and I believe that faith is based on evidence. Faith is the evidence of things and, and so I think that, that even though I don't have a PhD in some scientific field I'm learning a lot from people like Ariel Roth who does and people like you who knows things well I can learn and have my faith grounded even if I can't come up with the scientific answers for everything yes yeah. Uh, do we have a mic someplace? <laughs> I came in a little late, but um, 30 some years ago, an attending told us, this is, uh, she says, don't read the textbook, go to the journals, because by the time the textbook comes out, is over with. There's a lot of truth in what she said. Um, you see, science, the knowledge, changes all the time. What is taught in the medical school here today, just a few years from now, it's going to be nonsense. But the Bible is the same. Um, I, I like what he has to say. I, I'd love to read his books. In fact, if you could kindly tell us uh, to even get to this one, Biola. Yeah. I've got a couple of them here. Sure, I'll, I'll write it down. Look in Amazon. So we, we, um, we need to be able to defend what we believe in. And of course, don't go into areas that, just like the preacher in, um, in Europe, um, we've got to know what we're talking about. I think that's very, very important. Should be able to defend ourselves. Uh, or else it falls apart. So, uh, again, we have a beautiful message. We can go to anyone, any intellectual, anywhere in the world, and be able to come up with the reasons for our faith. One of the things that I do know about, and which was my area of study, was curriculum and education. One of the things I had to do was study textbooks and try to decide which ones the North American Division should use and that sort of thing. And I can tell you absolutely that what's in a textbook was gotten together by a bunch of people that sat down and decided here's what we're going to do and by the time it's published it's seven years out of date. Doesn't make any difference what the field is. It takes a long time to get a textbook published. It takes a lot of back and forth and, and I don't know of any science book that's come out, and maybe you can correct me, within one year after it was finished. Typically it's five years. Exactly. It takes a long time. Well, in five years, think how many things can change. So uh, I would not accept very much writing in a student's doctoral dissertations that was taken from books. I wanted it from the journals. Yes. Oh, here. But, but when things change in five years, is it more what we believed was true, we found is not true, or is it more that we that there's additions? Yeah, I think about pharmacology, and you know, we've amoxicillin changed, still works. Right, but we've changed our ideas about things. For for example, 
I've written probably thousands of pages to the state of California over how we define the kind of education we offer. Um, they change their minds not only on content but on ideas and so uh, you know every every time I wrote answering a new set of questions I thought but that's not what they were talking about five years ago in this other document and so there's there's a buildup of frustration for me but you make a good point not everything in the book is changed not everything that we thought before is wrong some things get built upon and get better and better. It, there, it, it has all of that. But I you can't just say, well, this is the latest one, so it's all wonderful. Certain fields are, are, are more static. I'd say, for example, anatomy is, is pretty static. You know, okay. There's a certain number of muscles. I mean, they discovered one like about 15 years ago. There's actually midline muscle that, that always cut the cadaver, you know, and they just destroy that. <laughs> years later, somebody... <laughs> Actually found dissected it. a different way, and they actually found a muscle in the human body. Is like, wow, you know. I think it'd been almost a hundred years since they had found the previous muscle. You know? So, uh, but that's quite the exception. Um, areas of technology, of course, that you know, uh, that changes quite a bit. I mean, that, that really is you know, almost an exponential sort of increase. Um, but then, uh, I would say not the hard sciences, but softer sciences. Uh, that are really complex, then I think you can have different views on what's the best way to do public health or uh, or. Okay, you can answer. I'm not a scientist. Tell him. <laughs> me, I was off somewhere. What was your last <laughs> comment? I'm suggesting that there's... I'm suggesting that there's different... Uh, in, in different fields have diff different nature in terms of how much of it changes over time. I gave the example of anatomy that doesn't change much over time. Technologies like, for example, um, the um, monoclonal antibodies, you know, in, in pharmacology, there's a big revolution in, in all sorts of fields. You know, that, it doesn't change what was done before, but, it, but there's additions to it. Right. Perhaps areas like education, you know, like say, for example, the Common Core, there's, you know, it's like... Well, it, it, in education, it is constantly evolving. It's depending on... L let's go ahead and answer your question first, and I'll respond to that. Well, as a matter of fact, what you said was a segue about into what I was thinking when I didn't get to you completely. But um, in my experience, since I've been in this for a very long time, dramatically illustrates, but also brings to me cautions. Uh, I finished my doctorate when the Nobel Prizes for uh, Molecular Genetics were just coming out. I found myself teaching stuff to freshmen a couple years after my doctorate that I had not gotten in my PhD training in physiology. So it was a dramatic illustration. But would we say that that change in the understanding of biology diminishes its relevance and importance because it's a change? And I don't want to respond to any particular comment, but I would love to hear those in this group and other places say that one of scientists' great, greatest, one of science's greatest strengths is it's ready to change and update. Uh, the other end of this is uh, near the end, at the end of my career, teaching physiology in depth for a long period of time. I kept looking for a new textbook. And I kept going back to the one that I'd used for 10 years that they weren't updating mm -hmm. because it was still the best, mm -hmm. I felt, and the information was 90, 95 percent accurate. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think change, for the right reason, is a real positive. Mm -hmm. And one of the big strengths of science. Uh, and some of those things that you say were changed or that, that, that you didn't agree with anymore, that's a teaching opportunity. You can look at that and say, okay, of here, course. here's what we've done, here's where we are now. Okay. But, I've been uh, the pharmacology thing, that stuff changes all the time. Well, yeah. 
there's addition to it. What was true before, what I've spent, you know, I, I'm, what, 20 years away from medical school. The things that I learned are still, I, I still use it. It's just that there's new medicines that have been invented, basically, or discovered, uh, that are more effective, and therefore, it doesn't change what was done, what, what was true in the past. Uh, it's just that it makes it sort of irrelevant, because there's, in certain certain fields, there are medicines that, why would you use something that's less effective? It, or, you, okay, she has her. I'm a medical, metal, I'm sorry, I'm a middle school teacher, and um, I teach out in Atlanta, Georgia, near Atlanta, Georgia, and your idea about the textbook, we were long awaiting the by design textbook, and um, excellent source, excellent science textbook, I teach science, and what I have found is I have to find a balance between what is in the textbook and what is on the computer. And we also have to be very cautious about what is on the computer as well. But we are able to find the balance between fact and faith. And, you know, there's all sorts of different things out there. Um, as far as getting the students to, to really think and research, you really have to prod them because they have everything at their fingertips nowadays. And so, you know, I, and I, of course I talk about the old days where I had to get so many different references and so many different this and that. And I said, it's right here. But the thing is, is you've got to know what is fact and what is not. And so when you're, when you're talking about textbooks, we always supplement with technology because Yes, we know that there are new and different ideas, but the textbook is the basic line, you know, for the students to base everything off of. And um, I'm really enjoying the by design. I don't know if you had anything to do with it or not. Who is the who is in charge of the by design book? Um, you mean as far as authors were concerned? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, there's I a remember. there was a whole committee. Um, I think I was still on the North American Division Curriculum Committee at the time that that, that was voted, mm -hmm. and it hadn't come out yet when I retired. Right. Yeah. It's been out for about three years now. Yeah, that'd be about right. Yeah. But, but yeah, I think you know I'm I'm enjoying this because I do teach evolution, and I do teach creation because that's what our books do. But I, you know, I always put it out there. Both of them are very much a matter of faith in belonging to either train of thought. And I, you know, we look at it in so many different ways and so many different um, aspects that, you know, the kids after a while, once we get finished with the unit on um, evolution versus creation, they're like, it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation. And I have to say, yeah, I concur with that. And there are lots of evidences for creation. Oh, Faith is based on evidence, which I think is very important. Um, go ahead. Well, I hope, I hope uh, this is, it's a slight change going back to something you said, but... Okay. Um, this, for me, is quite personal. Uh, my son is a physician uh, with several board certifications. And his passion is lifestyle medicine. Uh, this is just happening right now. Uh, and he and a small group are leading nationally. There is a new medical residency that is just now developing. In fact, the AMA is just now certifying it as a specialty in lifestyle medicine. My son, and it frustrates him a little bit, I, I don't want to go into all of it, says, Dad, Ellen White. Yeah. Yeah. As the core for what is most accepted, and according to him, Harvard's way ahead of us in picking up these ideas and going with their lifestyle medicine. Yeah. 
almost exactly as Ellen White said it. It's kind of easy to think back to the white lie yeah. Yeah. and all of the bad things that, that came from knowing who to accept and who to re- reject and putting together a very meaningful I, I, uh, I remember when that book came out, there were a, there was a big flurry in the oh, church yes. at that time. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm old enough to remember back in the times uh, when physicians thought that if you wanted to cure an earache, you blew tobacco smoke into it. I can remember that as a small child. <laughs> <laughs> Blow tobacco in the earache. <laughs> and my uncle, who was a physician, was the one that would smoke the cigar and smoke. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Getting into uh, some of the problems you run into, let me just uh, give an example. This uh, when I was six years old, my tonsils were taken out, and my brother's tonsils were taken out, and my sister's tonsils were taken out, and everybody's tonsils were taken out. I remember that because the tonsils were bad. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't have a purpose. <laughs> we, have, we have these dominant ideas. Mm-hmm. How, and the only way to escape from these dominant ideas, from authorities, is to disagree with the majority. Mm-hmm. What are the criteria we should use when we're going to escape a paradigm? I think, I think his book on loving the Lord with your mind deals with that. This was a very short video, um, 20 minutes or so. Um, I think you would appreciate some of the ways he answers questions like that. What does he suggest? <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading the book. I haven't got it. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I, I would suggest at least... Uh, that we go beyond the criteria or the ethos of the particular group that is making the, the, the assertion. Yeah. He, in, um, I think in this book, the last chapter, he has five steps that you can take in order to prepare yourself and to how to answer questions. And he, he does a very thorough job of doing what we've presented here in a few minutes. Yeah. It seems to me, if we look at the total and the broader picture, and always look at the broader picture, otherwise you may suffer from the uh, problem of specialization, which uh, can mislead you completely. Uh, To me, at least, that's the only safety in trying to escape a paradigm. Uh, More information is better than less. He, He made one... thing, one statement at the end of one of his videos. Let me see if I can find it here. We are, we are in the most divided, according to him and other people, time in our country that we've had since the Civil War. And I'm sure you've heard other people say that. And he says, we don't just have two sides, liberal and conservative. What we have is three worldviews. And here's what he says they are. Supernatural Christianity, which believes in God and demons and angels and miracles. Scientific naturalism, which he defines as scientism. And postmodernism, which he says is relativism that says if it's true for you or true for your culture, it's true. It was interesting to me when I was teaching graduate students how deeply that particular view was ingrained. It's what I believe. My culture teaches this. And, and no, no amount of rational thought could break into that. I remember one young woman who said her father was a Jew and her mother was a Catholic. But they're both right. I said, how do you, how do you see that they're both right? How, where are they right? And she couldn't explain that, but she knew that they were both right and, they were, and she believed them both. I, I was really surprised at, at that. I I was surprised teaching how difficult it was to get Adventist kids to think deeply. They really, 
Starting, I, I've taught everything pretty much from first grade through PhD, through doctoral students. It's just as difficult to get a doctoral student to think as it is a seventh grader. I, I, is, am I right? <laughs> we need to be teaching deep thinking starting in kindergarten. And we need to be have have it grow and build on itself so that kids can answer questions when they go to graduate school. Yes, sir. Uh, what happened to that other? I guess so which way will go, as the center mentioned, with majority or minority? Okay, I can't. Percent or five percent? Oh, it depends on the evidence. Depends, depends, to me, it's on faith and knowledge. Depends on the knowledge, because faith can take you anywhere. And good example is, as we know him, uh, Dr. John Lennox. So he's a man of he's faith, good. Yeah. a good Christian believer, right. Right. but also has the knowledge. Right. So, uh, and his influence in the world is amazing how God can use him or anyone who is in that kind of category to, to be a witness uh, for God. But in order to be that, then we have to, have a mic. to meet both, you know, to have a faith and also to know. Thank you. And to have the answer on that faith, why I do believe that way. But in order to, as you already mentioned, to do that, yeah, we have to dig, dig deeply and, and, and study and and achieve the, the higher degrees, one or two. I think he has he has two doctoral degrees, you know. Lennox? And, uh, and, and especially when you have a faith and you are a believer in God, so your influence, it's, it's amazing to, to people and through your presentation or, or writings and praise the, God, praise the Lord for uh, the people like, like him and our good people too, you know. If, if you are a person who's interested in science and or mathematics, the person I would recommend that you read is William Dembski. Read his book on intelligent design, which has about half of the book which is mathematics, which he said, if you're not a mathematician, skip this part. Well, I read it because that's like a challenge to me. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> it was way, way, way. But if you are interested in mathematics and in a way that it, it proves or gives evidence for there being a God who is really, really smart, you want to read William Dembski as well. I've, I've looked at Lennox's stuff too. He's very good. There are a lot of really outstanding authors. And remember what Ellen White says. Not all of God's people are in the Adventist church. A lot of his people are in other Christian communions, including the Catholic church. So we don't want to stick out our foot and stumble people unnecessarily. Yes, sir. Thank you for recommending William Dembski. I like Dembski. I have most of his books. <clears throat> he has written, I think, about ten. Yeah. Yes. And he has, in fact, been, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the intellectual leader of the intelligent design movement. Yeah. And... Um, uh, the book from Dembski that has most uh, excited me is the book which he titled The Design Revolution. Mm -hmm. But there is too much to say about Dembski. <laughs> uh, he and I are old friends. I asked him if he would come here and in fact he was willing to come and lecture at Loma Linda. Dembski was except that when I asked him what his normal honorarium might be, he said he would come for $5,000. So that becomes an expensive lecture. Actually, that's a, that's a very inexpensive lecture. 
<laughs> you could have raised that in this group. Uh, the one, the one thing that has not changed since I was in this lecture room previously, and from my earliest time here, about 40 years ago, is Ariel Roth. And I want to just say to, to the class and about him, uh, I really respect that Ariel Roth is always here. You can always depend on him to be the first voice that, that wakes up to comment on what has been presented, as he was this morning. That's right. A man is, is imperishable, and I don't know how, what he's at age now, but he was about a hundred when I first heard him. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I had him come and speak to my faith and learning class one summer, and the response of the students was, when are you going to have him back? He's the best speaker of the lot. <laughs> Well, Ariel, thank you for being here. And you always have your first assistant, your wife, with you. <laughs> All that is good comes from God. Yes. Yes. Oh, some... And the, and the good Lord said, just before he left the world, he says, and the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached to all the world, and then shall they come. Um, the comment that you made that your son has several specialties, but he went into lifestyle medicine. Um, I travel, and um, one of the times I spoke to Rajiv Gandhi University in India, 3,000 students. All of the students are at the top from different high schools who come there. Three the Night after night, they would come to listen that. The first night, and there were prophecies there too. The first night, of course, you shocked them with medical knowledge, and then says, "Can I, um, can I quote the scriptures, the Bible, <laughs> everywhere?" Yes, go ahead, and then shared the gospel with them. You know, and lifestyle medicine. By the way, it works. It works beautifully. Yeah. Muslim countries where no pastor can stand and speak. What a beautiful message the Lord had entrusted to us, Seventh-day Adventists, yeah. to take to the world, not presented by argument, but by deep love for human beings. Today, 60% of all new diabetes in the world is found in Asia. The what? Diabetes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And what a golden opportunity. I, I spoke at a regional heart center in a Muslim country, and all of the uh, administrators took me and said, let's come, we'll go, we need to talk with you. Sit down there in their conference room, says, we have something in common. All of us here have something in common. We're all diabetics. Please help us. You see, that's our job. So, you know, my dad was a pastor. He never retired. When he was 88 years old, dying, he was still working. So you teachers, you never retire. No, look, look, you know, look, Adventism is not what it was 30 years ago. Adventism is not what it was when I was in school or elementary school. We have a job to do. Are we losing our calling and someone else is picking up? Um, we, can, we can go home. Um, and we need to be doing thing, uh, our part, really, to be going home. And I'm really, truly really excited for what you presented. Perhaps we should meet sometimes in Sabbath afternoons. What can we do to leave our legacy, you see, uh, for others to pick up and keep on going? Elijah and Elisha, we've got to be able to do this. There have to be many aerial roads. Yes, we've got to be able to do this. The, the Lord's work is not going to fizzle up. He's going to take us to victory. Thank you, by the way. Thank you so much for yeah. the presentation. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Um, I think we were supposed to quit 15 minutes ago, so if you want to quit, that's fine. Thank you. I, w I have one last thing I would like to say. I want to go home.
Amen. Amen. Hopefully soon. <laughs>